So um, I'll just jump right in. And Eric, I appreciate uh, that introduction. I'm so excited to be here, uh, particularly excited about the opportunity to work with the Saugatuck Douglas uh, History Center in that fisheries heritage uh, project, which has added a tremendous amount of value to a uh, state regional Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage uh, Trail Network in partnership that I'll, I'll share more about uh, later. Um, I do have the pleasure of having my own copy of Bounty and Bust and uh, my only sad sadness about a virtual uh, talk today is I don't have the opportunity to be there uh, in person to get my copy uh, signed by uh, the local authors. So a great read, encourage you to pick it up. So uh, I'm Brandon Schroeder. I work with uh, the Michigan Sea Grant Program uh, with a little bit of an identity crisis. Uh, we're really cross-tied as a federal program uh, under the umbrella of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, so tied to the Marine Fisheries Service or the Weather Service or the Marine Sanctuary Programs like the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary Program here in Alpena, where I sit. Uh, but we're a university-based uh, program, uh, non-regulatory, but a program that supports Great Lakes science and research. And through our extension programs really asks, how do we use um, science and research uh, to take care of our Great Lakes? Because we know they're extremely valuable to us in terms of their ecological, economic, and social values. And so really just thinking about how do we uh, not only take care of, but really capitalize and benefit from uh, all of these uh, Great Lakes and natural resources uh, riches in Michigan uh, through, through the use of science. And so I'm excited, I'm a fisheries uh, scientist by training. I serve as an extension educator in Northeast Michigan, Northern Lake Huron. A big part of my work is in, uh, in, in working with Great Lakes Fisheries uh, Industries. I do also a lot of work in coastal tourism, uh, biodiversity conservation, and um, a, a big part of my work involves uh, engaging youth in, in our Great Lakes uh, stewardship conversations. And so Sea Grant is involved in a variety of work from fish to education to uh, coastal economic development and uh, healthy coastal ecosystems. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on fish and fish heritage. And I'm hoping to, to share a, a fun uh, look uh, at our fisheries through the lens of our past, uh, present and future. Um, so just thinking about what I wanted to share today, I wanted to frame um, out the conversation and what I wanted to share in a context of a publication that Michigan Sea Grant produces, The Life of the Lakes, A Guide to the Great Lakes Fisheries, uh, which is newly uh, revised and updated and out in its fourth edition. Um, and Eric's going to drop a link uh, to that publication in the chat, but also a, a Michigan focus uh, that kind of follows that framework of The Life of the Lakes. Uh, through the lens of Michigan's Great Lakes Fisheries, uh, an opportunity we had to publish a small piece in the Michigan History, Michigan Historical Society's Michigan History Magazine, uh, Small Fry and Big Catches. And so uh, a link to the uh, uh, draft version of the PDF of that article will also be shared. Um, and I think I always want to start by just uh, appreciating how amazing our, our Great Lakes are, right? So they're this, um, they literally define uh, uh, Michigan's uh, uh, boundaries uh, in fact, our state boundaries go out to the middle of uh, four of these lakes. Um, you can see them from space. Uh, they really are ocean-like in nature, minus the sharks and the salt water. Uh, they really are our freshwater seas. Um, they represent five of, the, of nine of the largest uh, freshwater lakes on Earth, 11,000 miles of shoreline, 20% of the world's uh, fresh water available, uh, available to us on the surface of this planet. And if we're talking fish, it's worth noting about 180 species of uh, fish inhabit uh, these Great Lakes uh, ecosystems. Pretty significant and really spectacular resources. And to put it in the context of our ocean coasts, so I, I should say that the, the Sea Grant program as a, as a federal program is an ocean science program, uh, East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast. And we have a Michigan Sea Grant program and a Great Lakes Sea Grant network because of these freshwater uh, seas. And if you put it in the context of our, of our cousins on the ocean coast, it, it really, uh, and this is a Wisconsin Sea Grant illustration, but you really see how significant and massive these resources are. Uh, so the Lake Huron that I work on, the third largest freshwater lake uh, by surface area in the world, 30,000 islands uh, could eat up Puget Sound. And uh, most people are pretty familiar with Chesapeake Bay, which you could pretty much insert uh, in the entirety of Lake Michigan. These are significant resources and they're extremely uh, valuable to Michigan uh, fisheries 
and beyond. So from a standpoint of fisheries, and again, I wanted to frame this out in the context of our, of our um, Life of the Lakes publication. I just really wanted to take the rest of this time to celebrate our Great Lakes fisheries, uh, share a little bit of a foundation in terms of ecology and management, uh, reflect on uh, what our fisheries, uh, Great Lakes fisheries look like today, uh, how, and how did we get to that fisheries of today uh, through a little bit of a walk back into history and time and thinking about how does history, uh, um, uh, how does history um, reflect in the history in the heritage of the fishery that we know today and then the, the future chapter of the life of the lakes is really what I think of as an issues uh, exploration thinking about some of the issues uh, that impact our fisheries not just in the past and present but thinking uh, into the future so the ecology and management uh, chapter of this book really lo looks at uh, fish and ecosystems and, and looks at the, the, the fundamental management uh, concepts and, and some of the institutional arrangements of the local uh, state, federal and tribal governments that, that collaborate in, in researching, monitoring and managing our Great Lakes fisheries. Uh, new to this edition of the book is some, some uh, lake profiles that are specific to each of uh, the individual Great Lakes. Um, from a fishery standpoint, I mentioned 180 species of fish, and I think um, it's fun to think about the values of those fish uh, in terms of how we participate in the fishery. And um, uh, my Mich Michigan Sea Grant colleague, uh, uh, a mentor and, and, a, and a boss uh, uh, and a, uh, for Michigan Sea Grant, Dr. Taylor and Abigail Lynch, uh, wrote this piece for the American Fishery Society called The Four Fs of Fish, and thinking about what really are those values. and. And the four Fs uh, are really fun. It, uh, if you think about going out and just fishing for fun and the, and the joy of, of participating in fish, uh, a fish at the end of your, your, your line, um, and, and food, and thinking about uh, the food values of that fish. That fish at the end of the line could be a dinner, but we also have a, 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 a substantial, substantial commercial fishery that operates on the Great Lakes with the intent of providing a food source, a, a high quality, uh, local, um, very healthy uh, protein uh, that is caught sustainably out of our Great Lakes. Um, and then that fun and that food is economically valuable, depending on how you, you um, uh, do the accounting, four to seven billion dollars annually is what that Great Lakes fishery is worth from a financial perspective. And to have that fun, to have that food, to have that financial value, you really need to depend on a healthy functioning, that fourth half a functioning ecological food web. And so if you think about those four values in our fish, it really um, uh, really brings it home in terms of how we interact and, and, be, and benefit uh, from that Great Lakes fishery and gives us a, a value and purpose in, 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 in caring for that Great Lakes fishery. Uh, the 180 species of fish, uh, it's fun to think about them. Uh, we're really rich in, in Great Lakes fish uh, not, compared to the oceans, it's not that many, but if you start to name them, you'd probably name the fish that you catch for fun or for food. You're going to name uh, walleye and pike and salmon and trout and, and sunfish and all the different species you catch for fun. But then there's all these other awesome fishes um, that are participating as a part of that food web. Um, I'm going to skip to the next screen here. Uh, all those other fishes uh, that are functioning as a part of that ecosystem in terms of the minnows, about 50 plus species of minnows um, swimming around out there, uh, living their lives, but also contributing to that food web and smelt and sculpins and darters and daces and all kinds of uh, amazing fish that contribute as a part of that food web. And that food web isn't just limited to fish. If you think about the smaller organisms, the, the invertebrates, uh, the zooplankton and the phytoplankton that all contribute to a part of that, that functioning uh, food web and functioning uh, ecosystem. And this is a overly simplified uh, look at maybe at our Great Lakes. But if you think of our Great Lakes and you think of Michigan as being all, all a part of the Great Lakes watershed, every drop of water that falls on Michigan is draining into our Great Lakes. Then our, our, our rivers and streams, our inland, inland lakes, our, our, our um, river mouths, um, our near shore areas of the Great Lakes, our offshore open water, uh, our offshore deep water, um, all of those um, water ecosystems provide some habitat for some uh, variation of this diverse uh, fish community that we benefit from. So, and you, and you can probably relate to that in terms of river fisheries or fishing from piers 
or if you fish from a boat being out on the open water uh, lake you're not pursu pursuing Chinook salmon and the neat thing about our Great Lakes and Michigan fisheries is pretty much anywhere you're going to find water and we're rich in water resources you're going to be able to benefit uh, and participate in that fishery. In terms of the uh, life, life of the lakes and kind of thinking about um, that, that management uh, foundation uh, and going back to the importance of that ecosystem function, uh, one of the il illustrations my colleague, uh, Dr. Dan O'Keefe, uh, helped to compile is this, this, this basic concept of what does it take? And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a common um, ecology uh, food pyramid you might have learned about in in high school or middle school, but really applying that to our Great Lakes and asking the question of what does it take to create 10 pounds of Chinook salmon. Now, uh, mind you, there was a 30 plus pound Chinook salmon caught in, in Northern Lake Michigan uh, recently. So what did it take to make 10 pounds of that 30 plus pound fish? And if you go down that food chain, you're talking about 75 pounds of alewife, 2000 pounds of zooplankton or animal uh, plankton and 7,500 pounds of phytoplankton or the floating uh, plant life out in, in the open Great Lakes. And that's a little bit of the food perspective, but then if you think about that fish production and thinking about managing those fish from a sustainability standpoint, you're really thinking about all those factors that go into the life and death of a fish, right? You're thinking about the, the fish, I'm gonna skip back a slide for a second. You're thinking about this, this food web, or not food web, but the, the life cycles of the fish and the habitat needs, the food, water, shelter, and space that those organisms need from the, the from their earliest egg, um, from the egg stage to their, their sac, and, sac fry and larval stage, to their juvenile fish to the adult stage. So we most often recognize these fish at the adult stage, uh, but you gotta recognize to have those adult fish, you, you need those fish to be producing eggs and you need those eggs uh, to be surviving and uh, um, uh, moving through that, that uh, life cycle into adulthood. Uh, and so if you think about that, those fish really have three jobs in life. Uh, they're, they're, re they're reproducing. Uh, if you have adult fish and a healthy adult fish uh, population out there, you're hoping that those fish can reproduce eggs and habitats that will sustain um, eggs and, and the hatching of those eggs. Uh, survival, those uh, eggs, those small fish, those juvenile fish all have to survive or not get eaten or have enough food to survive long enough to grow into adulthood um, so that they can reach maturity and, and replace themselves. So that's really thinking about the production side of it. And then the harvest side of it, thinking about the fish population and managing all of the different ways that fish might be re removed from that system. Uh, some of that might be natural mortality, uh, fish dying of old age or disease or being harvested by uh, birds, uh, but then it also encompasses the harvest in the many, many different ways that we take fish out of the ecosystem too. So I'm going to shift uh, to how, how do we take fish out of the ecosystem and how do we participate in a fishery? And I think what, one of the things I really have always appreciated about our Great Lakes fisheries is the diversity and the uh, diversity of values and the diversity of the many different ways that 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 humans participate in the Great Lakes fishery. Um, we've talked a little bit about recreational fisheries. Recreational fisheries can be a business if you're a charter fishing uh, operator, uh, commercial food fisheries, tribal fisheries, um, aquaculture, uh, a tremendous diversity of ways that we participate in that fishery. And that, again, that ranges from river fishing uh, with, with fly fishing to worm fishing, uh, we fish off boats, we fish from piers, uh, we wade fish, we fish through the ice, we fish from canoes, we fish from motor boats, we have large commercial fishing vessels. Uh, there's a tremendous of, of different ways that humans have found to interact with this fishery. And um, I'll just emphasize a few highlights. The sport fishery, thinking about the Great Lakes fishing alone, not all, all fishing in, in Michigan, but the Great Lakes waters fisheries across um, all of the Great Lakes states. About 1.8 million anglers fish on our Great Lakes um, each year. And in Michigan, um, Michigan's fisheries represent about 1 million to 1.2 million, depending on the year, fishing licenses purchased to fish in all of, all of Michigan's waters. Uh, so a significant number of people fishing uh, recreationally. Uh, the business side is that that is Michigan's charter fishing industry and there's charter fishing industries in, in each of the Great Lakes states, but Michigan's industry is between four and 500 charter captains 
who are doing uh, serving um, an audience who who are willing to pay somebody to take them recreational fishery fishing, and then again the economic value of that fishery is anywhere between four to seven billion dollars annually, depending on how who, what economist and what econ economic accounting you're doing. Uh, interestingly, in the shadow, and this is this is significant. In the shadows of that fishery is is a significant commercial fishery or a food fishery, and I, I think of these. Uh, uh, fishermen as, as farmers of our Great Lakes, a very sustainable uh, commercial fishery harvesting around 40 to 50 million pounds. Uh, we're about, about 40 million pounds annually currently with a dock side, that's not at the restaurant, but the dock side value of 46 uh, million pounds uh, of fish being brought in annually. And what's interesting about that is um, those are two different management scenarios. Managing for commercial fishing is different than managing for recreational, fish, recreational fishing. Uh, and in Michigan, we have a scenario where we can we can have both. We can do both and. And it's, it's significant because uh, fish, uh, countries from around the world have visited Michigan to really ask that question of how do you operate a commercial fish, fishery um, side by side with a recreational fishery. So that is definitely in, in the world scale, the world conversa conversation, a, a highlight of our, of our Great Lakes fisheries. And, and, and one of the ways we do that is by targeting uh, fish in our commercial fishery that are not of uh, necessarily of high recreational value. So think of whitefish, uh, bloater, um, we, we would call them chubs, you might think of uh, smoke chubs. Uh, there are some yellow perch and lake trout, which are recreational fish, but also uh, commercial fish and in lake herring or cisco. And then a lot of uh, fish like channel catfish and carp and sucker show up in that catch as well. So um, we, we participate in this fishery. We have a lot of values in this fishery. I wanted to uh, take a step back and, and dive back into time and think about how that fishery has evolved in terms of like an industry, innovations in the industry or, or evolution in the, in the fishery. And I think what's uh, neat about humans interacting with the Great Lakes is that um, as long as there have been humans in the Great Lakes region, humans have been dependent on uh, Great Lakes fisheries for uh, food, um, at the very least, if not fawn and financial uh, values too. Uh, so the first copper fishing hooks that were um, crafted maybe out of the Keweenaw uh, copper country or the first bone spears or the first uh, nets um, woven were all uh, at that time, innovations that really allowed us to capitalize on, on the fisheries riches. Um, and thinking about tribal uh, Native American fisheries, um, I'm here in Alpena, um, where uh, we sit at the heart of the Thunder Bay River. Uh, the Thunder Bay River um, is known, and they're, they're dammed up now, but known for the rapids. And, and um, you know, the local community lore would say that is probably called the Thunder Bay River because um, coming from the north or the south, you could probably have heard those rapids thundering uh, for, for, for many, many, many miles uh, down the road, if you will. And so uh, the Thunder Bay River sits at the middle of um, uh, uh, two different uh, treaty areas. And, and um, there is some thought that, that that treaty boundary is maybe not, not by accident, and that the Thunder Bay River, as one example of a river in Michigan, was that important to Native Americans uh, thinking about uh, the fish that would have run in the fall, the whitefish, the lake trout uh, that would have come into shore or run up those rivers that would have been uh, you know, that tremendous bounty of food uh, that you would have been harvesting, getting ready to go into the winter. And as you, uh, you know, scrapped your way through the coldest w Michigan winter, you'd be, um, you know, uh, praising the skies for the, um, the, the riches of fish in terms of suckers and lake sturgeon that would have been running those same exact rivers in the spring uh, to, to run up river to spawn. Uh, but those suckers and sturgeon would have been that spring uh, food source that would have uh, maybe uh, been that blessing uh, that, that came uh, in out of the Great Lakes uh, into, your, into your campfire uh, pit um, after a long winter. So, Again, Native Americans, uh, a lot of uh, the fishery that we know today, today is influenced by Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans in 1836 and 1842 treaty areas uh, have protected their, their um, uh, retained and protected their Great Lakes fishing rights and, and are still tribal fisheries are still a significant uh, part of our fishery today. Uh, but when Europeans first uh, explored uh, the region and began settling the region, a lot of 
what Europeans learned about the fishery and how they benefited from the fishery as a, as a food source, sustaining uh, some of that early exploration settlement was learned uh, directly from the tribes. And I like this image, this postcard image from the, the St. Mary's uh, River area, which shows that collide of uh, Native American uh, fishing culture uh, with some of the European, early European influences in the St. Mary's River. And this is uh, the St. Mary's River is famous for its, uh, its spring and fall fish runs. And here you see uh, uh, Native Americans uh, with Europeans uh, netting uh, fish that are spawning, spawning in that river, probably uh, white fish or, or lake trout in the rivers at that time. Um, Europeans, uh, you know, with, with the, the technology of sailing, um, Mackinac boats, and Mackinac boats take a lot of different uh, varieties of form. And I, I once heard it explained to me that Mackinac boats were essentially the pickup trucks of their day. Uh, there's a lot of different variations in how they look. And what they're used for is pretty much anything. What would you use a pickup truck for to haul? to haul grain, to haul furs. Uh, when the fur industry wanes, uh, you would haul fish. Uh, so Mackinac boats uh, early on uh, were smaller vessels, um, easily owned by many, and uh, were a way that uh, people participated in, in, in the fishery, uh, particularly the, the economic value of the fishery advancing as the fur industry wanes. So beyond subsistence, the fishery in the late 1800s started to take more of an economic importance um, in replacing the economic uh, values lost in the waning, the waning fur industry. And what's neat about the Mackinac boats, and there's a lot of research done on this, is the Mackinac boats in, in the Great Lakes region are, are, are somewhat distinctive to the Great Lakes region uh, because of the Native American uh, influence. And so uh, not often talked about, but Native Americans at, at around the same time were also sailing. So the marriage of European sailing uh, technologies and tribal sailing technologies uh, really gave a distinctive Great Lakes flavor to the Mackinac uh, boat style. So the Mackinac boat um, uh, really still um, being a smaller vessel kept uh, fisheries, uh, these subsistence and commercial fisheries closer to shore uh, and you were really dependent on, on the winds. Uh, so you might go out early in the morning to harvest from your nets and depend on those late morning winds to bring you back to shore. Um, as fisheries advanced and they took on more of an economic importance, um, the fishing gear, and this is an example of a pound net or a pond net, uh, depending on where you're at in the Great Lakes region, it goes by different names, but it's basically a near shore set net. Uh, cedar posts, cedar common in Michigan, cedar posts were driven to create these fence-like um, uh, netting systems. And I'm gonna try to use my mouse to show this like lead line. Uh, this pot net would have been set closer to shore and then kind of like an oversized flat version of a minnow trap. These fish would run into this as they migrated along the shore, run into this lead net and kind of funnel their way into this pot or, or this, this pound net enclosure. Uh, because, um, and these have been set in, in Lake Michigan. Uh, I've, I've heard tale of them set at well over 100 feet where uh, cedar posts were lashed together to get that 100 uh, feet of depth and, and how do you drive a cedar post at 100 feet of, of water in Lake Michigan, you can ask uh, the Beaver Island uh, Historical Society because there's a lot of neat documentation on that, but, but still typically closer to shore. Um, and then um, a lot of that sailing technology was traded off and on with open deck uh, rowing style boats where you could have more of an operational platform for, for, for moving around in the boat deck and harvesting fish. But the idea was that you'd set these nets um, and then go out and, and, and dip, dip the fish out of these pots. Um, and so a lot of, um, by the early 1900s, you're thinking uh, still like Lake Herring, Cisco, smelt and so forth. Um, moving uh, through the early late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, up and through the 1960s, uh, the other distinctive vessel form that that came to the that that really evolved in the Great Lakes was the gillnet tug. Um, and I see uh, somebody on the call here had an, had a gillnet uh, tug in the background. Um, the gillnet tug is unique. Uh, it's uh, nicknamed the turtleback tug. Um, they were first made out of wood, uh, later uh, sheeted with steel, and even later yet made entirely out of steel. Uh, but these really became the heart and soul of, of the commercial fishery. 
in the commercial fishing industry. Uh, if you go to the East Coast, West Coast, or Gulf Coast and, and, and throw this image up on, on a screen among commercial fishermen, they would, they would kind of cock their head and say, what, where, where is that from? Because it's, not, it's, a, it's really a design distinctive and unique to the Great Lakes. Uh, and that enclosed uh, uh, deck allowed these um, tugs to be able to fish um, in colder and colder weather and to, to kind of brave the, the, the winters of, of, of the Great Lakes. And with the advent of engines, you could get farther and farther um, offshore. So the gill net um, on the bottom left here is kind of a, a net uh, fencing kind of a system with the idea of creating uh, a mesh size that would target a certain size of fish. Those fish swim into the net and get uh, caught in their gills. Um, you would then, um, so maybe set that net out of the stern of the boat using the power to stretch the net uh, tight and then uh, um, uh, uh, um, out of the port or starboard side, you'd, uh, depending on uh, what, how your boat was set up, you'd, you'd retrieve those nets and, and pull fish out, out of the nets um, into the boat. And then on the trip home, you'd probably be processing those fish inside uh, the hull of the boat. So the, the, the turtle uh, the turtle, the turtle back gill net tug is is most iconic in my mind of the Great Lakes commercial fisheries at its height. So at its height, uh, by the late 1800s, the the commercial fisheries uh, were producing 150 uh, million pounds um, annually, which definitely was not sustainable. Uh, and a fleet numbering of these gill net tugs, uh, numbering 900 plus vessels, uh, fishing pretty much every corner of the Great Lakes. So as as that fishery waned and as um, fisheries collapsed, and I'll chat about that in a second, and as um, we transitioned into a, um, recreational fisheries, uh, commercial fisheries um, sought different ways to reach deeper waters and, and fish in, in different, using different technologies. So the advent, which actually comes pretty early in the 1900s, so as early as uh, 1928, these first trap nets are set in Lake Huron. But these open deck um, trap net boats um, allow for the fishing of these trap nets, which can be set in much deeper water. And these bigger vessels allow, uh, you know, farther reaches out into the Great Lakes. But the neat thing about the trap net, which is pretty much the, the most uh, common modern day commercial fishing vessel uh, and gear style, is that these, these, these are basically pound nets or pond nets that are, are covered on the top. So you can set them in much deeper water. They have the same lead system, the same funneling and pot system, uh, but you require a much um, heavier, a much bigger boat, uh, much heavier winch gear, much bigger motors, uh, engine power to be able to retrieve those nets from the depths of, of the Great Lakes. But in context of a recreational fishery, the advantage of this trap net gear is now you can start to sort fish by species. You can sort them by size. Um, and you can, you, can, you can sort them uh, by, by season in, in the context of the fish in those pots are, are captured alive and can be released if, if non-target. And then I participate in the fishery this way. I think of the Henry Ford, uh, you know, he made, Henry Ford made cars, but that model of assembly line mass production uh, also allows uh, anglers to have a boat uh, on a trailer behind every car in every driveway. And so from the charter boats to walleye boats to bass boats, the mass production of boats really allowed more and more people to participate in a fishery, which, which, which is really, if you go to any harbor today, is really what you see reflected in our, our, our modern day recreational fishery. So where, where am I going with all this industry evolution is just to say that these boats, these fish and boats, uh, and people fishing over time tell a story of our Great Lakes fishery history and heritage. And that history and heritage is really still reflected in today's um, in today's fishery. You can still uh, buy commercially fought, caught fish at the fish market, and you can still participate in that recreational fishery, which looks uh, different today than it did a hundred years ago, but is still equally as valuable in terms of uh, that those four Fs of fish. So um, going back uh, in the timeline again, uh, I'm going to I'm going to change my tune from that. The, the gear and the ways that humans have caught fish. And I want to I want to put that in a different context of, 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 a, of a timeline and some of those ecological, social, um, uh, economic, and technology influences on that fishery. So I mentioned this and I'll say it again because it's significant. Um, by the turn, by, by the late 1800s and turning into the 1900s, um, 
commercial fisheries were harvesting about 150 million pounds uh, of fish out of our Great Lakes each year um, at the height of that commercial fishery. That was significant. It was definitely not, not sustainable. Um, and this is what um, a, a fish scientist would call a death graph for whitefish, one species in, in Lake Michigan. So, you know, there is this era of ruin uh, by the late 1800s and the early 1900s where we may have gotten a little, little carried away. Uh, so to the left is this, uh, over, this harvest, significant harvest of fish um, on the dock. And that was a scene uh, from east to west, north to south across the Great Lakes region. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times fish running up rivers to reproduce. The tributaries of our Great Lakes are really critical to our fisheries from an ecological standpoint because most of the fish we have um, in, in, depend on in the Great Lakes, utilize river systems to find river or wetland or near shore spawning habitats. So the ability for fish to move inland to inland waterways is part of that life cycle uh, sustainability uh, need. Uh, so to have little fish, our big fish in the Great Lakes uh, typically need to be able to move into tributaries. And those tributaries were also affected by the timber industry, which um, really deforested much of Michigan and really impacted the water quality by increasing temperature and creating sand erosion into the rivers, which filled in the gravel sediment uh, needed for spawning of at least our river fisheries. And then with agriculture, you know, wetlands were filled in. I grew up in the Thumb area of Michigan, which was an important wetland area, and now it's an important agricultural area. So the development of Michigan really impacted uh, fisheries habitats while also probably over harvesting fish at the same time. So going to that forest degradation, um, the loss of forest habitat, the, the flagship species, the Arctic grayling, which is now uh, a, a big, the conversation now is restoration of Arctic grayling populations in Michigan, a DNR, MSU, and many other partners conversation. Um, but, but those river affected river systems, um, not only affected fish like grayling in the rivers, but again, affected the reproduction area for Great Lakes fish. And then at the same time, you, you think of the industrialization of our Great Lakes uh, shoreline, which is a whole nother story, but the industrialization was tied to the, the ability to ship products, um, access that Great Lakes water, ship products using Great Lakes water, but also became the dumping ground for that industrial, industrial waste. And so the tales of uh, lakes uh, being on fire, um, uh, the Cuyahoga River was not the only river that caught on fire in this, in this era of water quality degradation. And then habitat loss. Um, so some of the significant things I look at from a fishery standpoint is, uh, you know, wet loss of wetlands. Uh, wetlands are an important spawning and nursery area for fish. Hardening of shorelines. Our coastal shorelines are important, especially coastal wetlands are important spawning and nursery areas for fish. And then uh, dams, we uh, dammed rivers for uh, milling grain and milling wood and, and for hydroelectric power. Uh, but those dams were also uh, barrier, became barriers to the connectivity of fish moving out of our Great Lakes into the rivers. And notably here is the lake sturgeon. Lake sturgeon uh, spawn, live 100 years, reach 100 to 50, 150, 200 pounds, uh, and they don't reproduce until they're 20 or 30 years old. Uh, but, but even in that long lifetime, where they need to spawn, where their eggs are laid, are in some of the highest gradient, think white water, gradient areas of the Great Lakes. So those highest gradient areas, the white water areas of our Michigan tributaries became hydroelectric dams because that fast moving water could also generate electric, electricity. So the many ways that we develop Michigan, I guess uh, my point is uh, from agriculture to hydropower, to shoreline developments um, um, all have impacts on fish through time. And then um, aquatic invasions, um, sea lamprey, to the upper left corner, uh, and this sucking mouth. Sea lamprey is a fish uh, that was introduced to the Erie and Welland Canal, uh, had devastating impacts on, on, on fish like the lake trout. Um, these fish from the Atlantic Ocean were designed to feed on much bigger fish like sharks and tuna um, are much smaller, um, though big, much smaller uh, Great Lakes fish, which were already being impacted by habitat and overfishing. Uh, think uh, last nail in the coffin uh, were, were devastated by these parasitic uh, sea lamprey. 
Um, at the same time, um, this invasive alewife, upper right-hand corner, was also moving in through those same waterways. Uh, and without the predators like lake trout to, to keep a cap on these newly introduced prey species, um, you started to see alewives washing up on, on beaches, um, basically eating themselves out of house and home, exploding populations, large die-offs of alewives rolling up on the beach, creating uh, nasty, stinking uh, beaches to the point of, of, of stories uh, uh, the point of stories being told where bulldozers were needed to clean beaches of, of dead and rotting alewives. Uh, and even before um, sea lamprey and um, alewives by the 1920s, 1940s, even before that, in the earlier 1900s, uh, another invasive rainbow smelt were accidentally introduced um, in the Crystal Lake area uh, with the idea of keeping smelt in Crystal Lake, but escaping uh, now to the entire, entire Great Lakes region. So these invasive species in my mind are a lot like biological pollution, um, you know, where chemical or physical pollution could plausibly be cleaned up. These biological critters being introduced to the Great Lakes are living organisms who uh, survive, survive, grow, and reproduce. And, and once they're here, they're really, really here to stay. We write a check to the tune of 17 plus million dollars annually to, to keep uh, control of, of sea lamprey numbers to a level where our, our recreational and commercial fisheries aren't impacted still today. And I think um, the last, um, I'm gonna try to keep watching the time here, try to keep us moving, but um, that was some of the ecological damages. But uh, this is a story that I never heard about as a fishery scientist going through fish school 101 and graduate school and beyond is you really always have to keep in the background all of the social and economic influences um, that, that were happening at different um, time periods and eras of time. And so um, I mentioned smelt and I mentioned um, sea lamprey and alewives, which had devastating effects on an overly fished Great Lakes po fish population. So an already damaged fish population receiving even more damaging invasive species impacts. But um, what were some of the other social economic influences? You know, fish through time have fed war efforts. Uh, and the best illustration of that might be uh, World War II. Uh, so by 1942, the state of Michigan was actually ramping up fishing licenses to a thousand uh, fishing licenses. So actually increasing fishing pressure. And the federal government was deferring any fishing crews or industry workers from uh, deployment with the idea that they stay home and catch fish to feed the war effort, feeding people at home. Uh, and by 1943 and 44, anybody tied to the fishing industry was deemed an essential uh, service or essential worker. That's the highest form of deferment in the federal, federal government, right? So why that's significant, if you go back to this death graph of Lake Michigan, why that's significant is uh, Randy es Eschenroder, uh, with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, I've heard him make a case that smelt introduced in the early 1900s were probably, on top of commercial fishing, were probably most influential in changing the food webs in, in such a way uh, that they were probably a, a substantial reason why these fish stocks collapsed in the 1900s. Where they tried to recover, where fish stocks tried to recover, you introduce sea lamprey and alewives, which definitely double collapsed or triple collapsed this fishery on top of overfishing, smelt, and now this new invader. Um, so this leads you into the middle 19, 1940s, uh, the war effort where you have a federal and state government saying, hey, we know fish stocks have entirely collapsed, but we need to catch more fish. So we're gonna double, triple, quadruple our effort and we're gonna go around the state recruiting people to do that. Uh, so those social and economic factors are just as important as some of those ecological factors driving this collapse in fishery through time. So um, sad that a lot of a lot of we mess things up, but what humans are really good at uh, are fixing things and to bring us back into a, a fishery that we value today. Uh, we made a lot of changes uh, to clean up our mistakes. Uh, we passed the Clean Water Act. We passed the Clean Wetlands Protection Act. We formed the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which is a non-binding but a multi, uh, bi-national Canada, U.S., uh, local, state, and, and federal government commission to manage the Great Lakes fishery. Their highest uh, mandate was to mandate ma manage sea lamprey, which were really the the, the keystone devastating uh, fish, devastating 
or suppressing fish at the time, but now that fish commission operates to coordinate uh, fisheries research and management and enforcement. And a lot of the, the decisions that are made on fisheries across the Great Lakes Basin are discussed at this Great Lakes Fishery Commission level. To deal with AOIs, we introduced Pacific, Pacific salmon, coho and Chinook salmon from the, the West Coast. Now, we invested in native species restoration efforts from Lake Sturgeon to Lake Trout. And the biggest thing is we regulated fisheries. We invested in habitat. We invested in people fishing uh, and people fishing. So um, there's more to this story, but the point is, is we invested in um, our invested in our fish habitat. We invested in our fish and we invested in the human values, the fishing uh, values of our Great Lakes fishery. Um, and then note, uh, just in that investment, notable to Michigan, there's two iconic figures here, Vern Applegate to the left and Dr. Howard Tanner to the right. So Vern Applegate uh, was instrumental at the Hammond Bay Biological Station in Presque Isle County for uh, discovering the chemical that became the foundation for managing, still today, for managing sea lamprey um, across the Great Lakes Basin. Um, the, today, Hammond Bay Biological Station is still the center of some of the most cutting edge research uh, for sea lamprey and invasive species control across the Great Lakes. Dr. Howard Tanner uh, made the decision to bring, uh, you know, Chinook salmon and coho salmon to, to the Great Lakes as a way of managing for uh, invasive alewives, but also for creating a recreational fishery. And below, uh, in his namesake, or in the Chinook namesake, is the research vessel Chinook, which operates out of Alpena and has done a lot of the monitoring of Chinook salmon populations, ups and downs, uh, through time since those first fish, those first smolts were dropped into, into the rivers. So um, a lot of history there, um, thinking to the future. Um, I, I think what's neat about the life of the lakes is, is that future, who can really predict the future, but the idea of the future is, look, think, in my mind, is really thinking about those issues. And what's fun about that um, conversation is, in my mind, based on all of what I've just shared, if I were to have my crystal ball and look into the future, I would really just say um, pretty simply that many of the issues of the past are still pretty relevant today. So invasive species have had devastating uh, impacts on our Great Lakes and have really restructured the Great Lakes food webs as we know them today. But those invasions of the past are still relevant today as we deal with a different vector of introduction, the ballast water introductions and think of zebra mussels and quagga mussels and round gobies and spiny water fleece down here in the bottom, right? Uh, that are still uh, newer introductions, uh, 1980s, 1990s, uh, 2000 introductions, um, more recent introductions and are, are really still affecting our, our food web today. And then we hear stories of the, the, the big head and silver carp and the black carp moving up the, the Mississippi River drainage and threatening invasion of the Great Lakes. And, and maybe Nessie pops up in our Great Lakes down the road. Uh, but these issues, um, invasive species is not an issue um, that's gonna go away in my mind. Um, the Great Lakes Environmental Research, uh, NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory uh, tracks and monitors the non-native species established in our Great Lakes. And really there is, you know, there's a lot of publications on the top 10, top 20 uh, next invader species, particularly with climate change that threaten our Great Lakes watersheds. If you look at issues, um, if you look at issues, uh, I love this nature conservancy graphic uh, to the future. You see invasive species is at the top of their list. They still focus on water quality, an issue of the past, an issue of the future. Habitat lost, issue of the past, issue of the future. Climate uh, change, uh, you don't see overfishing. I think because our fisheries are so highly regulated, we may talk about historic overfishing, but one of the really um, prize of the Great Lakes fishery is that it is a very highly regulated fishery and many part people participate in many ways in a very sustainable way. But, but back to those issues, water quality, um, they look different today than they looked in the past. We're talking dioxins and PFAS. With habitat restoration, we're still talking about dams, uh, failing dams. Uh, we're talking about restoring uh, reef habitats in affected offshore areas <clears throat> and thinking about food web changes and how to manage among food web changes that we may not have control of uh, once those invaders have, have taken place. Uh, 
Uh, and climate issues, I think climate issues are, are really unknown and complicated uh, in the Great Lakes. But I think what I would say about that is we know uh, from a fishery science standpoint, the Great Lakes are not immune. We know there's in terms of fish ranges, fish are very temperature driven. And so with fish ranges and water temperature changes, there's gonna be winners and there's gonna be losers. And then we wonder, there's a lot of research with lake whitefish that depend on ice cover for their reproductive cycle in the nearshore areas. A lot of questions about life cycle disruptions with climate changes in the Great Lakes. And then back to the regulated, regulated fishery, it is a highly regulated fishery, but I think the question we really wanna be asking in the future is that allocation of fisheries resources. Access to fisheries, considering those diverse values. How do we continue to, to have a fishery that um, has sport and commercial aquaculture uh, food fisheries versus fun fisheries. How do we do all that in a way that 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 complements and works together? So in the news, you'll see a lot of, uh, particularly in Saginaw Bay, related to fish like walleye, for example, a lot of conflict uh, brewing over who should get the fish between food, recreational, uh, recreational and, and fun fisheries, recreational fun fisheries and commercial food fisheries, and then um, with the tribal fisheries, there's a um, the tribal. And, and state uh, cross-share fisheries through consent decrees uh, that are court-ordered consent decrees that are connected with these um, uh, early early treaties. And so those, those resource allocations between the state and tribes is also an ongoing discussion as they renegotiate an agreement that ended in, in 2020. So I'm gonna wrap up and Eric, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running long. I promise not to do that and I'm doing exactly that. But I'm gonna end by saying there's lots more to the story. There's lots more to share. Um, I wanna talk and with um, the opportunity for you all to explore more through the Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage Trail Networking Partnership. And what's been inspiring to me is the part, this partnership among uh, fisheries uh, from, from maritime local museums, maritime museums, uh, partners interested in fisheries history and heritage um, have been collaborating across the Great Lakes state and across the Great Lakes region to really say, how do we bring um, our fish heritage, uh, how, how do we tell these stories about our fisheries heritage through the lens of uh, fisheries history, uh, our fisheries today, and, and, and how do we apply that to our thinking about fisheries into the future? Um, one of the neat things that this trail has done most recently is created a website, an interactive website that was supported by the um, Office of the Great Lakes. Um, and that interactive website really allows you to look at uh, these fisheries heritage trails in the context, these fisheries heritage trail sites around Michigan in the context of some of these trail stories, thinking about all of the ways that our communities are woven together through fish, um, places to visit, the different places where you can visit to explore our fisheries history and heritage in more depth, things to do, places where you can eat fish or participate in the fishery. And there's a tremendous amount of section in terms of a tremendous amount of effort in this website, documenting resources, information, and, and partners um, across this network that are a wealth of wisdom and knowledge about our Great Lakes fisheries. So just to bounce you around the state, um, I'd bring you back here to Alpena where I'm sitting today. The Besser Museum for Northeast Michigan is home to the Catherine V, which is a, a retired uh, commercial gillnet tug built by the tribes, fished in Lake Huron all of her life, built out of wood, later sheeted in steel, fished through that entire period of, of iconic gillnet tug fishing era that I mentioned. At the museum also sits the RV Chinook, which through research has measured and monitored and told the stories of how our fisheries have changed since the introduction of sea lamprey and alewives. Um, at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary here in Alpena, a lot of maritime history and heritage, both in their visitor center, some Native American um, artifacts and fishing techniques um, interpreted, but also out in the water itself where some of these think farm tractors in the back of a farm field, um, some of the commercial fishing vessels or subsistence commercial fishing vessels that would have been uh, the farmer who fixed that boat until its very last dying day said, it's done, I'm gonna take it back to pasture and leave it in the fence row. Well, the version, the maritime version of that is dropping it in a shipyard in, in, a, in, in the Thunder Bay graveyard of ships. So here's the Maxwell, which is a commercial, a small commercial fishing vessel that reached the end of its days and was purposefully sunk to get it, get it out of rotation, uh, give it a watery uh, goodbye. 
the Michigan Maritime Museum in South Haven um, is home to the commercial gillnet tug, the Avalon S, and interpreted the war, feeding the war effort exhibit that I mentioned about Lake Michigan, or about the Great Lakes fisheries feeding the Great Lakes war effort. Um, her, the Avalon S sister ship, the Bob S, sits at the Beaver Island Historical Society. Some really fascinating history there about setting nets, pound nets deeper than I ever imagined possible in the Beaver Island archipelago area. Um, the West Shore Fishing Museum in Menominee is probably the most complete collection of the different styles of commercial fishing vessels and gear that would have been used across the industry and evolution timeline that I shared. The Aloha is a Lake Michigan gillnet tug that fished on both sides of Lake Michigan um, through her time period. She sits at uh, Sleeping Bear uh, Dunes National Park, so you can enjoy the dunes and get a little taste of fish heritage. They have a neat cannery exhibit with a lot of other commercial fishing artifacts. A living museum, not a museum at all, but Fishtown is uh, one of our oldest historic commercial fish towns that still operates today. You can see examples of gillnet and trap net tugs uh, fishing out of Fishtown still today. Go to the middle of the state or any of our Michigan DNR managed fish hatcheries and there's a lot of great interpretation there. The uh, Odin State Fish Hatchery in the upper middle of Northern Michigan, Northern Lower Michigan has a really neat exhibit, rail car exhibit that interprets the early uh, bringing of Chinook salmon from the West Coast uh, by rail car in these milk cans. Um, eggs brought across the country on train uh, to stock some of those earliest salmon in the Great Lakes. And then I, I, my last stop in Michigan is just uh, uh, back here and back there in Saugatuck Douglas History Center as a thank you for Saugatuck uh, Douglas History Center's newest uh, investments in fisheries heritage interpretation and, and contributions to our this state and, and regional conversation. I very much appreciate you know, uh, everything I've learned from being a part of uh, Sog Doug Douglas's uh, conversations, and I'm excited to have you all a partner in this regional network and partnership and fisheries heritage conversation. So with that, a website to the Fisheries Heritage Trail website. Eric, I apologize for running long, but I hope that was interesting or at least somewhat fun. <laughs> oh, that was great, Brandon. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, it's great to see, I think, our local history and Kind of put into this larger context and we'll have several uh, events over the course of the of the season that will kind of make these connections from the local to the larger regional and even national picture i'm going to put a couple links in the chat uh for uh for further reading things that brandon referenced uh, a great article in michigan history magazine on great lakes fisheries on the history of that so that's one to check out uh, and then uh, two other things there as well. Uh, but I, I do want to give an opportunity, if any of you have questions for Brandon, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, yeah, introduce yourself and, and go ahead and ask a question. Hey, hey Brandon, how is this working? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Randy. Yeah, Brandon, can you just speak to the Great Lakes water quality? I think we all think of it as having uh, deteriorated to its worst level, perhaps in the 60s and 70s and generally improving since then. Um, is that continuing to be the case or do you see new challenges on the horizon that would change that trajectory? Yeah, I mean, that, um, both. both. Um, so I, I, I would say about water quality, um, and, and bringing it home to people, you really recognize that in fish consumption advisories or, um, you know, we put out these eat safe fish recommendations. Uh, and so really, um, you know, if I were to prioritize invasive species food web disruptions and habitat loss are probably the two most detrimental to a sustainable fish population. But habitat, I mean, water quality on a Great Lakes scale is, is still significantly important, A, because fish swim. Uh, so eventually, poor enough water quality does eliminate fish from, from the water. But, but, but thinking about like mercury and PCBs, um, we talked now about dioxins and PFAS and, and things like that, those aren't going to immediately um, be noticed in terms of fish population or fish harvest. Um, directly, but where you notice them is in the ability to eat those fish. So thinking about bioaccumulation 
and um, those toxins being taken up through the food web, um, you know, small critters feed little critters that feed little fish that feed bigger fish, that bioaccumulation of contaminants is, is most directly impactful to us when we're eating fish, right? So you see all these advisories of um, not eating old fish or not eating big fish or not eating maybe in certain places uh, too many fish in, in a week or a month. And, and so past, present, future, um, mercury is probably a good example. So mercury is going to be a part of our fish contaminant story for as long as, you know, many, many, many generations. And, and mercury, even uh, best case scenario, mercury gets trapped in sediment and covered in sediment. But every time you dredge a harbor or you remove a dam and you release that sediment cover, you're re potentially re-releasing things like mercury back into the environment. So even contaminants trapped in the sediment are still occasionally brought back into the into circulation and still felt uh, through those fish consumption advisories. Uh, and those are issues like we're not dumping mercury in the lakes anymore, but we're not going to outlive that issue. Future issues, now we're talking about new things like dioxins and um, and PFAS uh, is, a, is a big thing in, in Northeast Michigan with the Oscoda Air Force Base, uh, but also nationally, those are new contaminants continue to be, you know, threatened and, and concerned to the Great Lakes. Line five and thinking about concerns of, of oil spills, uh, there's still a lot of dealing with the past while thinking about the future issues. Thanks, Eric. Hi, Brandon. This is Lynn Ripley. Hi, Lynn. I wonder, Lynn Ripley. I'm hoping to know something about how the effect of the high water marks of the current lake cycle are affecting uh, thoughts about the future and management of fisheries with respect to especially flooding uh, the rivers and uh, breeding areas. Yeah, that's a really great question. And there's a lot of really new, uh, interesting research out there. And there's a lot of uh, questions and, and considerations about the linkages with climate. Climate change, for example. So um, the lakes have always cycled ups and downs. And um, and that's, that's not a new thing. In fact, that's pretty essential. If you think of our Great Lakes coastal wetlands, a, a traditional cycling of the Great Lakes might be a 10 year period where water levels are very low and those shallow grade areas of the lakes, you know, they grow up and think of the beach, right? The beach grows up when it's got open to air. You have those nutrients exposed to air, you get all kinds of reeds and uh, rushes and sedges and, and sand cherries and you get all kinds of vegetation coming up. And then as that water cycles to fill back up, now what you have is an emergent wetland full of vegetation. You have a shallow, water covering all this vegetation, which immediately becomes really critical spawning habitat for fish that spawn in wetlands like pike and yellow perch are two really awesome examples. And so if you look back over trends of fish populations, probably what would happen is in off years in low water level, fish like pike and perch probably wouldn't have done very well reproductively wise. But when those waters came up and those coastal wetlands refilled, um, then you would have like these booms of perch and pike reproduction. And though those reproductive year classes that were awesome would like kind of carry, because these are fish that live a long time. Perch, you know, these are 10, you know, 15, 20 year old uh, fish. Uh, you know, so you can carry a good year class of fish can carry you over time if you're not like taking them all out all at once. And so um, that, that, that would be normal to see that. Some of the concerns that we're seeing with high and low water levels are the extremes and the, the, the long periods of time, which people are starting to wonder or trying to, to align with uh, climate change linkages. So like the abruptness, like we were at extreme lows and then within like a year or two, we're at extreme highs and, and the abruptness and the extremes is what, um, um, what, are, what has been concerning people. So right now in high water levels uh, and Central Michigan University is at the forefront of this research is there's, they're documenting a, a, an, an amazingly drastic loss of coastal wetlands that are feeding. I mean, the Lake Huron coastal wetlands are home to around 1400 species of plants and animals about half and half. Uh, so when those wetlands are gone, you've now lost a habitat for 1400 different organisms that are using the habitat for, you know, food or nursery area or, or whatever. And those, those nursery areas then feed a bigger uh, Great Lakes uh, ecosystem. 
So I, I think the cycling is natural and normal. Um, the links with climate change are concerning because of how, how drastic those changes, how, how, how drastic and how, um, how dra I guess drastic is the best way to say, how drastic those changes have been happening. Does that make sense? I hope so, but I hope that the is it the drasticness uh, predicted to be get worse. Yeah, I mean that, that's where I think there's, um, and 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 I am sure there's better research than what's in my head out there, but I, I think um, those the getting worse concerns are directly aligned with the broader, more global climate climate conversations that are out there, and and I think one of the neat things about the Great Lakes from a human standpoint is the Great Lakes act like these big hot water bottles. And so they tend to buffer us from climate extremes. Um, you know, so we can, uh, they, they, we're, we're gonna have like, you know, maybe milder winters and maybe a little warmer summers, but we're not gonna have those from a human perspective, those extremes that, that like you might see elsewhere in the world. From a, from a fisheries perspective, I think I, I would have, I would typically say there's still a lot of unknowns, uh, but we know that we're not immune to those changes and the water level, the drastic water level changes is one of those things that we think is a symptom of, of, of climate, climate implications. Thank you. We may have time for one more question if someone has a question for Brandon. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, I see people fishing on the Kalamazoo River, and I hear a lot of people say, I wouldn't eat anything out of the Kalamazoo River here. W what is the truth about what, what's happening? Would you eat fish out of the river here? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I would, I would eat fish, um, but uh, I'm going to qualify that. Um, I'm a male and I'm not going to be, I'm older in my age and I'm not going to be reproducing. I'm not, I'm not uh, going to be reproducing. I, I can't carry a baby. Uh, so I can't pass that off to anybody. Um, so one of the, so I, I worked previously for the Michigan United Conservation Clubs and then in my role as Sea Grant, one of the prides that I have in my career is being a part of the conversation of moving the conversation from fish consumption advisories, like being like, don't eat these fish to eat safe fish conversations where like, how do we think about eating fish in, in safe ways? And so there's a lot of great information through the Michigan Department of uh, Community Health. Um, eat Safe Fish is the, the campaign um, that provides information globally, but also in some very specific areas like the Detroit River or the Saginaw Bay system where there's some more specific concerns. Um, there's some neat NOAA studies out there um, where uh, researchers have gone to island communities where fish are eaten exclusively with the idea of monitoring how bad contaminant loading can be if you eat nothing but fish. And, and some of what those studies have found is those people li live longer and they, they, they don't have as much, they don't, they don't die of heart disease and they, they, they have less dementia. Um, so they have healthier hearts and healthier brains. So, so the pros and cons, fish, um, the, the fats and fish, and there's a lot of neat history. This is another story that would be awesome, to but uh, there's some really neat history in terms of how humans inhabited the world and that following waterways and following fish were probably pretty important in how humans came to be on, on earth and how humans moved around the planet, right? Following the fish. And uh, there's, in my mind, fish have become such and such entwined with our body chemistry that fish are essential essential to us. Um, the fats in fish, the fatty oils in fish are essential to brain health and heart health. And those two things to me are, are pretty essential to the rest of my livelihood. And so eating fish is important uh, for me in terms of maintaining brain and heart health. Um, there's not really another way to say, say that. So then the, the question is the risk. What's the trade-off of eating fish versus the contaminant loading uh, that you might might get with that same fish. So then your question is like, how often should I eat fish and what species should I eat? And so some of the like fattier fish, um, like cold water fish, say like a lake trout, for example, uh, might be have more heavy loading in it than say a, a, a less fatty fish like a, a bluegill, for example, an older fish versus a younger fish. Lake trout can live to be 50 years, uh, eating a smaller, uh, eight-year-old lake trout versus a much larger 
50 year old lake trout um, is a difference in how much contaminants that fish has taken up into its own fat. And then there's a lot of fish preparation too. So not all of them, not all of the contaminants, but a lot of contaminants are, are lipid based. So like a lot of contaminants are tied to your fat. So if you cut out the fatty elements, like the, the belly fat or the dark meat, uh, uh, the dark lines, the dark meat in fish, uh, if you bake fish versus um, deep fry fish, you know, deep frying in fat versus baking where fat drips off, uh, how, how the species, the age of species, um, the preparation of that species could all minimize the risk of, of, of contaminant loading that you're eating in that fish that is providing head and heart health. So, so I, I believe, I mean, my family, we eat fish all the time. We eat fish at least once a week. And, and I would say that the highest risk is typically younger kids and uh, women of childbearing age. You'll see that in the, the health recommendations. But that said, um, you know, my, my wife uh, and my kids, um, we, we as a family believe that eating fish, um, there's, the, there's a benefit uh, to that risk too. There's a risk reward. It's not just don't eat the fish. So I would never start with don't eat the fish. Well, that was great, Brendan. Thank you uh, for kind of connecting that and bringing it back to the local here as well, right on the Kalamazoo River. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, this program will be available uh, later today on our YouTube channel, where you can see some of our other virtual programs from uh, the past year uh, and even further back. Uh, I'll remind you, <clears throat> and I'll thank you for all of that.